guys and welcome back to my channel. This is episode number 8 of the Coastal Landscapes and Change series over here on my channel. It's an A-level revision series that I needed whilst I was doing my A-levels and so I'm doing it for you. Today we're going to be looking at Holdernest and Coastal Erosion so do stick around if you think that'll be useful. Subscribe down below, I upload these every single week, Monday at 4.30pm. We're going through the whole specification and so let me know what you'd like to see next, what series it is that you're after seeing I guess um, and yeah let's just get straight on into it. Holdernest Coast. For centuries erosion has been a problem along the coast of East Riding of Yorkshire known as Holdernest where stretches between Bridlington and Flamborough Head in the north and Spurn Head in the south. It has the fastest eroding coastline in Europe. On average, it loses nearly two metres of coastline every year. Since Roman times, the Holderness coast has retreated by four kilometres, and at least 29 villages has been, have been lost to the sea. Why is erosion such a problem, though, in Holderness? Rates of coastal erosion vary due to a range of physical and human factors, all of which can change both in the short term and long term. However, there are three main reasons why the coastline is ho in Holderness is retreating so much. The, the geology, the fetch, and longshore drift and beach material. Geology. Most of the Holderness coast consists of boulder clay. Boulder clay is also known as glacial till or drift, and is a mixture of fine clays, sands, and boulders deposited by glaciers after the last ice age. Boulder clay is structurally weak and it has little resistance to erosion. It produces shallow, sloping cliffs between five and 20 meters high. The chalk band that surrounds the boulder clay has created a headland at Flamborough Head. Erosion along fault lines and bedding planes has created features such as cliffs, arches, and stacks. The fetch. One of the main factors affecting the rate of erosion is wind energy. This in turn depends on the fetch, how far the waves have traveled. Holderness is exposed to winds and waves from the northeast, with a small fetch of about 500 to 800 kilometres across the North Sea. That isn't far in comparison to the waves crossing some of the world's oceans, but the waves attacking the Holderness coast are also influenced by other factors, which help to increase their size and power. Currents or swell circulate around the UK from the Atlantic Ocean into the North Sea. The Atlantic fetch is 5,000 kilometres or more, and so its currents add energy to the waves in the North Sea. Therefore, there are often powerful destructive waves that work along this coastline. Low pressure weather systems and winter storms passing over the North Sea are often immense, producing locally strong winds and waves. Low pressure air weighs less, raising sea levels, which in turn produce much higher tides than normal that reach the cliff base. Small, almost enclosed seas, such as the Mediterranean and North Sea, often generate huge waves during storms. Waves move within the sea, but cannot disperse their energy, rather like water slopping up against the side of a wash basin. The sea floor is relatively deep along the Holderness coast, so waves reach the cliffs without first being weakened by friction with shallow beaches. Longshore drift and beach material. The beaches at the Holderness coast are its main problem. The boulder clay erodes to produce mainly clay particles, which are fine and easily transported out to sea in suspension, rather than accumulating onshore as beach sand. Although there are beaches, they are narrow and they offer very little friction to absorb wave energy. Plus, there is never enough sand to stop the waves from reaching the base of the cliffs at high tide. The tide flows southwards, transporting sand south by longshore drift and leaving the cliffs at the Holderness coast poorly protected against wave attack. Beaches south of Hornsea have a reduced width because of an imbalance that exists between the inputs of sand deposited by a swash and the removal of sand due to backwash. Subaerial and coastal processes. The cliffs at Holderness are affected by weathering and mass movement collectively known as sub-aerial processes. Chemical weathering is relatively ineffective at Holderness, except on the chalk cliffs at Flamborough Head. 
mechanical and biological weathering are far more significant. The main types of weathering experienced at Holderness are freeze thaw and the alternate wetting and drying of the boulder clay, which makes it crumbly in dry periods. Slumping is the main form of mass movement, affecting the boulder cliffs at Holderness. The alternate wetting and drying of the clay causes expansion and shrinkage, producing cracks during long, dry periods. Subsequent rain then enters the cracked clay and percolates into the cliff, which becomes lubricated and much heavier. The weakened cliff cannot support the extra weight and the clay slides downslope under gravity. The slumped material collects at the cliff base and then is removed by the sea, causing the cliff line to retreat. Human actions and coastal retreat. It's not just physical factors that affect coastal retreat. The actions that people and organisation, collectively known as players, can take impact on coastal retreat, and the outcome isn't always positive. The impact of coastal management. This picture shows erosion rates opposite the locations to which they relate. The gaps on this show where the coastal defences are preventing erosion. However, it also shows that higher rates of erosion occur immediately to the south of these coastal defences. For example, the sea walls, groins and rock armour at Hornsea protect part of the coast, but they also interrupt the flow of beach material by longshore drift. The beach downdrift from Hornsea at Mapleton is then starved of material and its cliffs are exposed to wave attack. This is known as terminal groin syndrome and affects many UK coasts. The first sea wall was built in Hornsea in 1870 and it lasted for just six years. In 1906, a stronger seawall was built and has now been extended five times. At the southern end, the defences were reconfigured in 1977. The T-shaped rock armour is designed to allow beach sediment to accumulate and pass behind it. The groins built at Hornsea starved Mapleton, further south, of sediment. By the 1990s, nearly four metres of cliff were being eroded at Mapleton each year. Coastal retreat continues to be a problem along this stretch of coastline in particular immediately south of Hornsey's coastal defences, where the cliff top has retreated significantly since 1977, when the rock armour was built. Economic and social losses. Margaret Fincham of Golden Sands Holiday Park, south of Withlandsea, has lost 100 chalets to the sea in 15 years. She said, if we hadn't lost the chalets, then we would have had an extra 400 people visiting Withlandsea and helping the local economy. Withensea isn't alone in suffering economic losses due to coastal erosion. It is predicted that 200 homes and several roads will fall into the sea between Flamborough Head and Spurn Point by 2100. Nationally, the Environment Agency suggests that 7,000 homes will disappear due to coastal erosion by the same date. Individuals lose out both socially and financially as a result of coastal erosion, and very little financial help is available for them. No compensation is paid out for the loss of private property or land caused by coastal erosion in England. Between 2010 and 2012, the East Riding of Yorkshire Council used £1.2 million of direct money from DEFRA to trial different ways of helping people to adapt living on an eroding coastline. They gave some financial assistance to 36 households along the coast, supported by 16 relocations and 43 property demolitions. The remainder of the money was used to help residents through the relocation and adaption packages. East Riding Coastal Change Fund. This fund offers some limited help in terms of financial assistance, as well as free advice for those residents affected by coastal erosion. Its, relo pa its relocation package can fund the demolition costs for a property, some relocation costs up to a maximum of £1,000, and the expenses caused by relocating to a new home up to a maximum of £200. The fund also offers an adaption package which can help to pay for rollback, the expenses incurred as a result of an individual's decision to replace a threatened coastal property with a new home inland, but only covers things like planning application fees. Rollback was introduced particularly to address the risk to caravan parks, farms and homes in areas where coastal defences are not viable. Assistance grants. To adapt properties which may be at risk from coastal erosion in the future, such as relocating spectic tanks and waste pipes and changing access routes to some properties. 
And that is the end of episode eight of this series over here on my channel. I hope you learned something. I hope it was useful. If you did, please do subscribe down below. I upload these every single week, Monday at 4.30 p.m. Next week, we're gonna be looking at coastal flooding. So yeah, please do subscribe down below. Share it with a friend if you think they might find it useful. And I will see you same time, same place next week, Monday, 4.30 p.m. Bye, guys.